I'm Drew Stevenson, and this is a video for my professional responsibility class about ABA Model Rule 1.8a, which covers business transactions between lawyers and their clients. And in this video, we're going to be talking about some of the comments to that rule that um, it flesh it out and are likely to come up as uh, test questions on the MPRE or on my exam. And also a few pointers about uh, things to watch out for when you're in practice related to business transactions with clients. Now, I have a previous video that covers the actual provisions of the rule, and you should watch that first uh, so that we can pick up from there and go into some of the uh, highlights of the comments related to the provisions. So let's dive in. The requirements of paragraph A must be met even when the transaction is not closely related to the subject matter of the representation. As when a lawyer drafting a will for a client learns that the client needs money for unrelated expenses and offers to make a loan to the client. So remember that even if you are, let's say, representing a client and drafting a will or doing litigation, and then the business transaction is completely unrelated, let's say you're selling your car to your client or in the example in the comments, loaning the client money. The thing to keep in mind is that you are still their lawyer. So don't think, well, I, they weren't really my client for this transaction. They are your client. You're doing a business transaction with your client, even if the business transaction is unrelated to the representation. 1.8a applies to lawyers engaged in the sale of goods or services related to the practice of law. So, for example, the sale of title insurance, that's one of the most common examples, or investment services to existing clients of the lawyer's legal practice. So, if in addition to providing legal representation, you can sell the client title insurance, that's a business transaction. It's not just part of the representation and you have to comply with the writing requirements um, and disclosure requirements that we covered in the last video of 1.8a. Uh, this also applies to lawyers who purchase property from estates they represent. So a lot of times lawyers who draft wills for clients will be designated as the executor if the, of the estate when the client passes. So that means that eventually when the client does pass, the lawyer is the executor of the estate and often needs to liquidate some of the holdings of the estate or property in order to disperse the funds to the heirs. And so sometimes a lawyer will um, sell the property to himself or to herself or buy it from the estate. That's permissible as long as you recognize that it is a business transaction with the client that in the form of the estate. So you're going to have to do the writing and disclosure requirements of um, Rule 1.8a. Now, what does it not apply to? Rule 1.8a does not apply to ordinary fee arrangements between the client and the lawyer, which are governed by Rule 1.5 instead. So your standard fee agreement about representing the client on a contingent fee basis or hourly rate or flat rate for the representation comes under 1.5 and you that rule has special um, requirements for when it needs to be in writing and what the writing has to uh, include or entail. Sometimes, however, uh, clients want to pay their lawyer in property or uh, in, let's say an interest in their business, uh, an ownership interest in their business in lieu of fees. If your client does that, if they pay for part or all of their legal fees, in a property or the transfer of an ownership interest, that counts as a not only a part of the fees, and so you have to comply with the rules about fees under 1.5, but also a business transaction with the uh, client. So for example, um, you represent uh, a, a startup company and they have invented some new technology um, and own the patents, and so as they can't pay you yet because they don't have profits coming in, but they assign you, let's say, a 5 or 10% ownership interest in the patent rights. Well, that's a, a business transaction with the client, and you would have to comply with the requirements of 
A um, in that situation. Now, it also doesn't apply to uh, standard commercial transactions for goods or services that the client generally markets to others, like banking and brokerage services or medical services. If you represent a dentist and you go get your uh, uh, you know, a, a tooth filled or a cavity filled, uh, you don't have to do one the writing requirements and disclosures of 1.8a when you pay your bill. Products manufactured or distributed by the clients and uh, utility services. So let's say your client owns a restaurant, you eat at that restaurant, you can just pay your bill like any other diner. You don't have to uh, hand the um, your server uh, a form that says, here's uh, my understanding of a full and complete disclosure of the terms of this uh, transaction. I, I ate food and I'm paying for it and I advise you to seek other uh, legal representation, independent legal representation for this transaction. Uh, that's silly, right? You're just, a, you're just another customer in that situation. What, Rule 1.8 is about a, a, a unique deal or transaction between a client and a lawyer. Now, the risk to the client is greatest when the client expects the lawyer to represent the client in the transaction itself or when the lawyer's financial interest is great enough so that the lawyer has a material limitation. And also note that the lawyer must comply not only with the requirements of 1.8a, but also with 1.7. So there's two things I wanna say here. Sometimes a lawyer will at least try to tell the client, I'm looking out for your interests, I'm representing you in this transaction even though I'm the other party. Very often when there's a misunderstanding or a dispute arises later, the lawyer will say, I wasn't your lawyer for that transaction. I'm your lawyer for an unrelated matter. Well, in, in that situation, in either situation, that has to be very clear to the client. And if you are telling the client that you're representing them, that means you have uh, to put their interests before your own in the transaction. You have to look out for their interests and advise them if they could get a better deal or if they're being taken advantage of, which is, of course, awkward because they're being taken advantage of by you. Um, also, I want to point out from this comment, it's an interesting point. If you violate 1.8a, often you will also have violated 1.7, the conflicts of interest uh, material limitation provision. And you can be disciplined for both, right? So if a grievance is filed against you, a state disciplinary authority could say that you um, you had a material limitation, you did a business transaction where you uh, purported to represent the client and you were the other party and it was a high stakes transaction, a, high, a big dollar transaction. So you actually had a material limitation. Uh, here, we're not talking about you paying for lunch one time or uh, buying the, uh, the client a cup of coffee. We're talking about something really significant like the sale of commercial real estate or um, a, a purchase of a car or uh, something like that. And in that case, you could be violating 1.7 as well. Now, you may remember that 1.8A2 requires that you advise the client in writing of the desirability of obtaining independent representation from another lawyer in the transaction. If they already have independent representation, then you don't have to advise them of de the desirability of that. And so that part of the rule would then be inapplicable. Similarly, the requirement for full disclosure is satisfied either by a written disclosure by the lawyer involved in the transaction or by the client's independent counsel. So a couple of things here. Why would your client have their own lawyer already? Well, maybe you're a litigation attorney. You do the client's litigation work, trial work, but they have another lawyer who does their transactional work and they already do. And that lawyer has already agreed to represent them in whatever this transaction is, a loan or a buy and sell purchase agreement or something like that with your client. In that case, you don't have to advise them. They already have independent counsel. And the disclosure about the terms and conditions uh, of the deal can either come from you or from the other attorney who's representing them in the transaction. Also, the fact that the client was independently represented in the transaction is relevant in determining whether the agreement was fair and reasonable. So you may remember that uh, under uh, 1.8A1, uh, any business transaction with a client has to be fair and reasonable. 
Now, sometimes that's very clear. We have an appraisal value or an obvious fair market value for an item uh, that, that's being sold um, or uh, the services being provided in lieu of legal fees or something like that. Other times it's a little more subject to debate or it's a, there's something with a lot of subjective uh, value like a family heirloom that's being sold or something like that. Well, if the client has independent legal representation, it's not automatic that the transaction is fair and reasonable, but it counts in your favor. It would be weighed in your favor that there was another lawyer who could have advised them that this is a bad deal. Now, loans between lawyers and clients are among the most common situations to which 1.8a is applied. I have a few case, cases here for, just for purposes of illustration. You do not need to know these case names for my exam, but I thought they might help clarify. So we have this uh, case in rate uh, Timpani uh, from Illinois in 2004. After representing a client in a divorce and sale of marital residence, the lawyer borrowed the money from the proceeds. We have this other case I have here from Louisiana in 2002, a lawyer solicited a loan from a client who had received a large personal injury award. So this is actually very common. Sometimes you're representing a client and they get a windfall uh, as a result of the representation. They have a, It's raining money on them in terms of a, a personal injury award or marital property, or maybe they've inherited something and or received a large settlement and it, sometimes lawyers are going through a, a tough time and uh, especially if they have their own practice and having trouble covering overhead and will ask the client to lend them money and so 1.8a will certainly come into play you have to comply with the writing requirements and disclosure requirements of 1.8a in that case um, other common situations are sales and investment transactions that unfairly favor the lawyer or for which the lawyer has not provided required disclosure. So there's a 2001 case, for example, from uh, Indiana where the lawyer persuaded a client to invest their settlement funds in the lawyer's um, uh, uh, business ventures. Here's another one. There was a lawyer in Massachusetts in 2006 who purchased real estate from an elderly aunt for substantially less than the fair market value. And so again, you could be subject to discipline, even if it's a relative uh, for a, a transaction with a client that isn't fair and reasonable, where it looks like you're taking advantage of the client. Fees paid in property instead of money often have the essential qualities of a business transaction with the client, as we've already said. So here's a Missouri case from 2000 of a lawyer who accepted a quitclaim real estate interest in lieu of cash and violated the rule because they didn't comply with the writing and disclosure uh, requirements. This is one of my favorite examples, a Cotton v. Ronenberg, uh, Washington case from 2002. In lieu of a fee, which the lawyer had estimated at $10,000 to $30,000, the lawyer accepted the client's mobile home, but then promptly resold it for $42,000. The transaction was obviously unfair and unreasonable. The court held in, in within the meaning of Rule 1.8a. And I want you to look at that for just a moment. The, what the court was focused on was that it was unfair and unreasonable reasonable because uh, at most, at most, the client owed 30000 and the lawyer turned around and sold it um, immediately for forty two, which means it was obviously worth a lot more than 30000 I also have a problem with a lawyer who really has to estimate the fee at X or three times X. How could you not know if the client owed you $10,000 or $30,000? That's a pretty big range there. Okay, a quick word about how business transactions can, uh, with clients can lead to malpractice. So some of uh, the insurance companies that provide legal malpractice insurance, like ALPS, they're one of the largest ones, have advice on their websites for lawyers. And one good rule of thumb is the 5% rule. And this is about when clients want to sign over an ownership interest in their business. And so the insurers, the malpractice insurers, recommend that you never obtain more than a 
ownership interest in a client's business due to conflicts concerns. In fact, a lot of legal malpractice insurance policies are going to say that they are void or they don't cover you um, if you take more than a 5% uh, ownership interest. The degree to which an attorney can maintain independent legal judgment is inversely correlated to the percentage of ownership interest owned. In other words, if you own a big share of the client's business, it's harder and harder for you to provide independent uh, legal judgment because of your personal stake in the outcome and the profits of the business. Here's a quote that I pulled out from one of their blogs, from the insurance company's blog. One real risk with these deals is that the business really does prosper or terribly falters. In either case, the attorney can be in a difficult position. It's either that he has been substantially overpaid from the client's perspective or is now facing the reality that no payday is coming at all. So I want you to imagine a situation where you do $10,000 of worth of legal work to help a, a entrepreneur set up their new tech business that they're launching. They don't have the cash on hand to pay your fees, so they assign you an ownership interest, some, some shares of the company in lieu of fees. Well, then the company is a huge success. It's the next Google or Amazon, and pretty soon those shares are worth $10 million instead of $10,000. Well, in that case, obviously the client is going to feel like you were overpaid. You did $10,000 of legal work and almost immediately you have $10 million worth of stock that's going to seem unfair and probably lead to a dispute. The flip side is actually even more likely that the client assigns you what they say is $10,000 worth of stock in the company or ownership share in lieu of your legal fees. And then <laughs> within a few months, the client files for bankruptcy. And then the lawyer says, wait, I basically didn't get paid for that representation and it tries to seek other payment from the client um, for the, the services provided. But the client actually did pay you. So again, we're going to have a misunderstanding and a disagreement that often, and these situations often result in litigation between lawyers and um, their former clients. And so the malpractice insurers would actually prefer that you not engage in business transactions with your clients at all, or take an ownership uh, interest in one of your clients uh, businesses or enterprises because it introduces a lot of risk of conflicts of interest and therefore a lot of risks for a legal malpractice action. And that concludes our lecture about 1.8a, uh, specifically the comments and some practice pointers. We'll cover the other provisions of 1.8 in subsequent videos.